Thursday. It will cover all of chapter one in the book. All of chapter one. So we'll we start on chapter one, and this will cover the entire chapter. Okay? We will cover all that before Thursday. Uh, I'm not gonna be here for this day. Whoop, whoop. That is I be part of here. But my secretary or, or somebody will be here to give you the quiz. When you come in for the quiz, I'll, I'll give her these instructions too. But please spread out. Uh, you'll be able to sit all the way in the back. So we'll probably skip rows and have every other seat. You know what I'm saying? So like there'll be somebody here, but nobody in this row, people in this row, but nobody in this row, and then you'll have every other seat. I, I always begin with the assumption that you're honest, but if I ever see any student that is being dishonest in any way, you will get a zero on that assignment. That's a general that's a policy for the university. And I will submit it to the university. If you have multiple practice, you uh, submit it or what it takes out. Okay, but that's not going to happen. So it's not really that big of a deal anyway. So remember, I count what? The top five quizzes? I guarantee you seven, but we usually have more like eight or nine. So we'll probably have another quiz before the exam, which is coming up not that far from here. Right? We're here on the 30th, so we really just have two more weeks till the first exam on February 18th. I expect that exam to cover chapter 0, 1, and 2, and maybe even a little bit of 3. It just sort of depends how far we get. So, but at least 0, 1, and 2. Have any questions? What are you doing to prepare for the quiz? Like, what have you been doing for the past week or so? Every day. What? Reading the book. And then also looking at the old test. That'll help some. Although, I expect the quiz questions, they're sort of more, did you read this? Did you catch these big points in the book? So, uh, yeah, read the book is the main way. Maybe take note cards and sort of make uh, big ideas, so like you can bet that you can first, second, and or third law are going to be on there, right? Just have to deal a lot with those. Okay. You are nervous about it? Yeah. Zariah. Zariah? Zari. Uh, yeah, like everybody except for you. Yours is going to be like the big audience, I think. Yeah, there'll be multiple choice. If you want to get a feel for a question, like I said, look at the old text. Your quiz questions will be not dissimilar to those. So, right? Sorry. Yeah. Here. No scanning. So, the way it works, uh, I'll send you a video. I create my own bubble forms, and you'll have that bubble form on the back of your quiz. Uh, you need to know your N number. You follow me? You need to know your end number because that's how I, I read all your scores into the question. Okay? So don't bring anything. You don't have the equations. I'll probably just put the equations on the whole form from chapter one from the equation sheet, which is on the website. Uh, as I said, I'll send out a video just showing you how to do the bubble form. It's a lot like a scan term, but just, there are some special things for you to consider. I think I'll probably have Chris to do this. This is what I usually do on quiz days. I give you the quiz, you take it, you have like 15 minutes to take it, you give it back to me, and then I run off and I scan them, and then I come back and I give them back to you and I give you the answers, and that way you know your brain right on that same day. Clear? But I'll, I'll figure it out. I'm not sure if I have Chris to do that or not. All right. Um, <coughs> hope you had a good weekend. Good weekend. I moved my mother in law. My mother in law moved into. Uh, did I tell you how we moved over the past several months? We moved from the city to the country. Did I tell you all this? So we lived in downtown Thibodeau, sort of central Thibodeau, sixth and narrow area. And then we moved out to the country club. Uh, and so now we have a country house. That's what we call a country club house. And a city house. And my, my mother-in-law, she moved into the city house over the weekend. So it was exciting. We're glad to have her there. All right. So Newton's first, second, and third law. Remember we talked about these last time. Uh, you'll need to know the names of the law, the law of inertia, the law of acceleration, and the act law of reaction, or the action reaction law. Um, you also need to know just what they are, you know, how to describe them. You need to know inertia. Inertia is a measure of mass. If you have more mass, it's just harder to move something. Either harder to get it moving or harder to stop it from moving. That is inertia. 
and it's a property of, of all matter that's measured by, by the mass. Um, the law of acceleration, this idea that the acceleration is proportional to the force and inversely proportional to the mass. That's, uh, or that equation right here. Newton initially wrote the law of acceleration like this. Isaac Newton wrote the law of acceleration in a little bit different form, but we're not going to get into that. But it's very similar to this. I need to know about vectors and net force and free body diagrams. Um, on the test, I might give you a figure that looks like this and ask you what is the net force acting in the x direction. And the answer to that would be uh, 10 minus 5 is 5 newtons. And then the law of reaction for every force is an equal and opposite force. Remember the incorrect laws video that we watched with Derek Moeller from Veritasium? Um, those are sort of the normal ways that people think about the laws of motion. And that is that first they say that an object tends to come to rest because that's what you observe and that was sort of the Aristotelian way to think about things back in the 1600s, I guess. Um, but that's not true. In fact, we know that the only reason that things come to rest is because certain forces cause them to come to rest. And Aristotle didn't know that at the time. He didn't know about frictional forces. Uh, the second law is the law of acceleration. And remember in, in Derek's example, he said, if you apply a force, you come to some constant velocity, right? And we sort of see that in our car, that if we apply a force with the accelerator, that causes a force, and it takes us up to some constant velocity. However, in the absence of other forces, the force of the road, the force of the air resistance, whatever, if you would continue accelerating, going faster and faster and faster. And then the third is that if I have two objects that are interacting with one another, that you assume that the bigger object exerts a bigger force on the smaller object. Think about, I don't know, a truck running into a, a fly and onto the windshield. Then you assume that the truck exerts a really big force onto the fly, and that the fly exerts a really tiny force onto the truck. But that's not correct. That, in fact, both of them exert an equal and opposite force. A similar example is with the Earth and the Moon. The Earth is really big. The Moon is really small, relatively. However, they exert the same force on one another. The same is true for you and the Earth. That the Earth pulls down on you with about 700 newtons, and you pull back on the Earth with the same force. Not a smaller force, but the exact same force. Okay? So, uh, we've already started looking at some of the other forces. And one of those was weight that there are simply forces between objects of mass. In fact, there are forces between you and this room that are measurable. So, uh, Kiara and Felice, Marcella, Marcella, there are forces between the two of you that I can measure, that you can measure. Can you feel the force? No, you can't feel it, but it is measurable that there are actual forces because you are bodies of mass, and bodies of mass are attracted to one another. We don't fully understand why that is, the way that it is. In fact, if you can describe it, then, you know, Nobel Prize for you. Uh, but there are people that are working on that, trying to figure out, well, how does this whole gravity thing work anyway? We don't really understand that right now. Uh, there's another force called a normal force. These are just different types of forces that we'll be dealing with. The normal force, does anybody know what normal means? Not in normal in the sense of like usual or regular, but normal in a mathematical sense. What does normal mean? Kayla? I mean, Haley, I'm sorry. Perpendicular, right. So normal means perpendicular. And so a normal force is just a force perpendicular to the surface. Um, so if I have an object, we'll say it's a person, that is standing on a surface, they have a certain force that is the weight. However, if that's the only force that is acting on that person, then I know by Newton's second law that this person has to be accelerating. 
Because if I have a force on an object, then it has to be accelerating. Obviously, this person not accelerating because it's like me. Am I accelerating right now? No, not accelerating. So there must be another force that's acting on this person, and that force is the normal force. It is a force that's perpendicular to the surface. It is part of that action-reaction pair, right, by, by uh, Newton's third law. Uh, and it's always perpendicular to the surface. I can have other scenarios, like let's say that I have a wall, and I have a person that is pushing on the wall with a certain force. My brother used to have, uh, he used to sleepwalk a lot. Anybody else sleepwalk? Nobody? He used to sleepwalk a lot, and sometimes he would find himself in strange places. Like one time, he was up sleepwalking, and he went into a closet, and he, he shut the door, and he was having this dream that, that they were, like, bricking it up, and he sort of freaked out inside the closet, and he started punching the wall. And when you punch the wall like that, anybody ever punched a wall? I have not. Good. That's probably good. Don't, don't punch walls. But if you punch a wall, or if you push on a wall, you push in with a certain force, and then the wall pushes back with a normal force. And so when he punched the wall, the wall pushed back with a normal force. Notice this force is not vertical. That's not what normal means. It doesn't mean vertical. It means perpendicular. And then likewise, with an inclined plane, um, <clears throat> this is an inclined plane. This is my wife, actually. You'll see the picture. This is my wife. Anyway, this is an inclined plane. This is what, uh, what is this called, this machine? The hack squat. Uh, it's an inclined plane where you're pushing uh, weights up an inclined plane. But in this case, there's a normal force acting on her, and that normal force is perpendicular to that inclined plane. Okay? Often, but not always, Fn is equal to Fw, right? Like right here, Fn is equal to Fw when I'm standing on the floor. Can you envision a situation where Fn is not equal to Fw? Let me ask you another question. When I'm on an inclined plane, when I have an object that is on an inclined plane, and say it has a certain weight, Fw, is Fn equal to Fw? Is Fn less than Fw? Or is Fn bigger than Fw? We'll do it as a clicker question, A, B, or C. It is either equal, less, or greater than the weight. The normal force which I know acts perpendicular to the surface, we've already said that, so my normal force will be in this direction. Is it equal to the weight, less than the weight, or greater than the weight? The normal force. Okay, fewer of you had it right than wrong right now, but you can ask around and ask people what they put. On an inclined plane, is the normal force equal to the weight, less than the weight, or more than the weight? I want to remind you about something that we talked about last time, that if I have a force that is in a certain direction, that's sort of off axis, I'm going to draw my coordinate system here. If I have a force that is in a certain direction, I can break that force into two separate components, the x and the y components. Y'all remember we were talking about this? fx, fy, that these two vectors together are equal to this vector. 
that it's like I can replace the F with the FX and the FY. If that helps you a little bit. Okay, didn't help a whole lot. But we're going to stop. We'll stop at 150. It's okay. Remember with the clicker questions, if you get them all wrong, if you get them all wrong, I don't even care. That's okay. It's just on the quiz I want you to get. The quizzes and the exams. That's where you need to get stuff right. Okay, so, you know, we're sort of split. Um, let's imagine that I draw a coordinate system, and I'm going to draw my coordinate system like this. There's my Fn. There's my Fw. Now, remember, I can break Fw into two different parts. I'm going to break Fw into a vector that's like that, and a vector like that. This would be Fy, the y component of that vector, and that would be Fx. So this force right here, the weight of the object, I can break that into two different vectors. The x component of the vector and the y component of the vector. And these two, the purple vectors added up together, will be equivalent to the weight. So it's like I have one guy pulling right here, or I can have two guys pulling on that side of the I'm talking about. That I can have two guys pulling on back in different directions, and both will produce the same result. I can have a force pulling down in this direction, or I can have two forces pulling in these two directions, and that will give us the same result. It's the same. Let's try this question again, okay? So I want to tell you further that I know this thing isn't accelerating, so I know that my normal force has to equal to this force, because it's not accelerating in this direction. So Fn has to equal Fy. So is Fn equal to the weight? Is it less than the weight? Or is it more than the weight? Oh no, no, that's not right. Well, a few of you are right, but now more are wrong than before. Oh no! <laughs> Look, these two forces, these two forces right here, Fx and Fy, do you think they're more or less than Fw? Oh, they're not equal. They're not equal. No, they're not equal. <laughs> FX and FY together they're the same as F. So separately, we think they're more or less than F. Less, right. Because they add up to F. A vector sum, but they still add up to F. So is FY going to be bigger or smaller than FW? Smaller, right. So change your answer if you're willing. Yeah, you can change your answer. Yes, it's B. <laughs> oh. All right, I'm going to stop at 145. Okay, no joke for that one there. That one was a, a Charlie Foxtrot, as they say. Excuse my language. Um, so, my point is that the normal force doesn't always have to be equal to the weight. That, for example, on an inclined plane, the normal force is going to be less than the weight. Because your weight is broken down into these two component vectors. Okay? And our normal force is going to be equivalent to uh, just a portion of the weight. And in fact, here, the normal force doesn't even really have anything at all to do with the weight. It only has to do with how hard you're punching the wall. Joey did get out of that closet, by the way, but he punched his way out. And his muscle for all when he came out. So it, was, it was a rather traumatic event for him and his little brother. Um, let's consider this. This is, uh, gosh, what was the point of this? No, it doesn't. That's me, by the way. It doesn't matter. We'll just move on to the two types of friction. All right. Um, so there are two types of friction. Your book talks about this, static and kinetic.
static is not moving, and kinetic is moving. All right, that's just what those words mean. And so static and kinetic friction means that static friction is when an object's not moving, the frictional force that acts on that object. So, so here's this chair right here. I'm pushing on it, and it would be moving to the right, correct? Except there's a frictional force that's acting upon it. Because I am pushing on it, there's a force I'm applying, but there's no acceleration. That means there must be another force that's opposing it. And what is that force? I'm pushing in this direction. What's the force going this direction? The frictional force. And that is what type of frictional force? Static or kinetic? The static. So because this object is not moving. However, if I push it like this, there's still a frictional force that's resisting the direction of the motion. And that is going to be a static or kinetic frictional force. That's a kinetic frictional force because it's moving. Um, we can calculate the frictional force. Uh, I'm just going to call it F for now. F is equal to mu times the normal force. Well, let's describe some of this. Uh, F is the frictional force. Bless you. We can have either Fs or Fk for static and kinetic. It is a resistive force. That means it always opposes the direction of motion. Mu, this is the Greek letter mu. It's like a U right here, but with an extra little tail on the side. I know it looks like an M, but it's not an M. Although in the Greek alphabet, it, it serves the purpose of the M. It makes the same sound. Uh, but this is the Greek letter mu, you know, like phi mu. Any phi mu's? No phi mu's? Any tri sigmas? Delta zetas? Delta phi beta? Okay, are there any I'm missing? Zach, Deshaun, for 30? No. Um, mu is the uh, coefficient of friction. You can have either mu s or mu k. s and k refer to what? Static and connect, so not moving or moving. Uh, the coefficient of friction describes two surfaces. So this describes uh, friction. It's a constant. It's something that's provided to you. If you need to find it, you can calculate it or measure it. So if I have two surfaces, like my hand on the desk, that has a certain coefficient of friction. Or I could say my hand on ice, that would have a certain coefficient of friction. Which do you think would be bigger, my hand on the desk or my hand on ice? Which of those has a greater coefficient of friction, my hand on the desk or my hand on ice? The desk. And, you know, that sort of makes sense because when I put my hand on the desk, it's hard to move it around, right, because there's a lot of friction. But if I put my hand on ice, it's easy to move it around. So there's not more, much friction. So mu is directly related to the force, the frictional force. If mu is big, F is big. And you can, you'll know. I might ask you a question. Which has a greater coefficient of friction, steel on ice or rubber on wood? And what would you put? What has the greatest coefficient of friction? Steel on ice or rubber on wood? Rubber on wood, right? That sort of makes sense. You know what that is? Because there's a greater friction in between those two surfaces. Okay, this is kind of interesting. 
you can impress your friends with this. Mu s is always, almost always, practically always, bigger than mu k. That means static friction is bigger than kinetic friction. You ever tried pushing a box across your floor? You push, or a big piece of furniture, you push and you push, and after you get a big push onto the object, and you get it moving, then it's easy to keep it moving. Have you ever experienced that? You try to move a big piece of furniture, after you get it moving, then it's easier to keep it moving. That's because the static friction, when I'm pushing on a desk like this and it's not moving, there's a static frictional force going in this direction. I'm pushing in that direction and the static friction is in this direction. And then eventually I put enough force on it to get it moving. And now that I have it moving, the kinetic frictional force is in this direction and I'm pushing in this direction. And it's easier for me to push it. Put the desk back. Our custodian is very fastidious, not be rude. That's what makes her a good custodian. But she doesn't like us sitting at the desk. Mm -hmm. So, I want you to do something today, something you've probably never done before. That as you leave campus today, you know what Maywood, when you leave campus? All right, so as you leave campus, I want you to try to. You're driving along, you're driving along, and you know there's a stop sign at the end of this road. Are you aware of that? And so when you come to that stop sign, I want you to stop. Can y'all hear that for me? But I want you to stop very slowly. And so as you put your foot on the brake, I want you to notice what happens just before you come to a stop. Y'all know what happens? You ever me? You what? It won't back up, but it sort of, yeah, it sort of lurches forward. Is that what you mean? Like at, just as you come to a stop, it'll sort of jump just a little bit. That's the transition from kinetic to static friction because there's a difference in those two forces. And so as you come to a stop, the car will sort of lurch forward. And if you have a friend in your car or whatever, family member, whatever, say, oh, that's because static friction is always bigger than kinetic. <laughs> that's why it lurched forward. I mean, and they will think, that you are like the coolest person in the world. You're, you're going to go from here to there in their mind. Okay? Do you that for me? Okay, awesome. Uh, tension. Tension is, um, oh no, there's one more thing. So, this is also, is the frictional force is dependent upon mu, but look, it's also dependent upon the normal force. So, look, I can move this sheet of paper. There's a, there's a frictional force in between the paper and the desk, right? It's not very big because it's easier for me to move. But, Tony, I want you to, to try to move it. Oh, what happened? Did I change the surface of the paper or the desk? Go ahead. It was really easy. Look. Super easy to get in there. Go ahead. What do you mean? <laughs> What did I do? I applied a, a what type of force? A normal force. Well, I say I push down, and then the desk push back up with a normal force. And so, if I increase the normal force, then the frictional force will also increase. That's why heavy furniture is more difficult to move than light furniture. They have the same coefficient. But the normal force is bigger, and so that increases the frictional force. So I want you to recognize that frictional forces are dependent upon the coefficient, and they're dependent upon the normal force. Either one of those changes, and it changes the frictional force. You're not really weak. I was just, it was a trick. Okay, uh, tension. Ropes and cables can redirect forces.
So let's say that I have a force that's applied right here, and then I connect it with a cable to another point in space, then I can have that same force applied there. I think that's why I had this picture up here, actually. So up here, this is a, uh, what's this called? Is a cable machine? Yes, cable machine? Yes, sir. Okay, Zach used to work at the rec center, so he knows all. Well, y'all know what this is. Y'all, many of y'all are athletes or whatever. Uh, so, there, I'm applying a force right here, and there's a cable right here, and it's redirecting that force down here to lift whatever the weight is. Okay? So, I can use cables to redirect force through a tension force. All right. So each of those forces has a, um, a section in the book, and they go into a little bit more detail. As far as the exam goes, the exam will mainly will pull material from the workbook. In the workbook, I think that we cover the, the textbook pretty thoroughly. There are a few topics that we don't cover at all, and I'll tell you what those are as we come along. The quiz, however, the entire book is open. Okay, so anything that's in the book, well, could possibly be on your quiz, whether it's in the workbook or not. I'm not going to pick out my neat little details. I really just want to know that you read the book. I want you to read it beforehand. It'll help you on the exam to come up later. But uh, anything in the book is fair game. Okay? As I said, you'll find that I cover almost all the time. Let's try these, okay? Do the one on the left. The force in your bicep muscle attached at your shoulder and forearm is called a what type of force? Your bicep is attached here and is attached up here. What type of force does that bicep muscle, or what is it classified as? A frictional, a weight, a tension, or a normal force? What is that force called? All right, let's stop at uh, 55. Doing pretty well. Ask your neighbor if you're not sure. I'll go to one minute. But everybody, are we missing folks? 4, 8, 12, 16, 17, 20. Okay. All right, good. C is right. Uh, that is a tension force. So let me let me try drawing this. There's your elbow. Here's your your bicep. Or maybe if you're me, like your bicep is more like this. <laughs> uh, that's a tension force. That it uh, it applies a tension right here, and it applies a tension force right here. It's a, a tension force that transfers forces to your forearm from your shoulder. We'll talk about the insertion and origin points later. It's a tension force. Uh, Newton's third law says which of these? All right, let's stop at 33, 33. Everybody has it right. So if you're not sure, ask somebody if you're clicking in. You'll certainly have some questions about the first, second, and third law. Uh, FYI, the answer here is A, that's the third law. B is the second law. And C is the first of all. Look at the old quizzes and tests, or the old tests, and you'll see different ways that I ask that question. Hey, uh, what's the worst thing about living on O Street? Having to walk a whole block to pee. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, torques. Forces cause acceleration in a line. Right, F equals MA. If I have a force, it causes an acceleration. Torques cause it cause acceleration in a circle. So torques and forces are really similar in that way, in that both cause some type of change in velocity or an acceleration. A few definitions. Uh, torque, that's the Greek letter tau, that's what we use for torque, is equal to F times R times the, I'm reluctant to even write this, but I'm going to write it anyway, times the sine of theta. For our sake, so, um, let me just draw a picture of what I mean here. I have some bar. It's attached at a point right here, allowed to rotate. And then I have some force that is acting over here. So this is my force F. The length of the bar is called R. And then the angle theta is this angle. For our sake, uh, well, for most of our sake, for most of the time, theta will equal to 90 degrees. We'll see some scenarios when we start talking about the deltoid, because the deltoid has a very small angle theta when it's attached to the uh, when it's attached to the arm, and so that that causes the force. It has to be really big. So we'll get to that where if theta is not 90 degrees. But for now, we will assume that theta will be 90 degrees. So in this case, theta is 90 degrees. And this equation then simplifies just to F times R. But I'm going to put a little symbol here. And that means that F is perpendicular to R. OK? So um, we can just use that equation, that torque is equal to F times R. But I'll put that little symbol just reminding you that those, in order for that equation to be true, F has to be perpendicular to R. But let's look at this equation for just another minute, and we'll come back to it later with that sine theta. When you open a door, right, you apply torques. Can you all see me over there, Hannes? So when you open a door, you apply torques. And there are a couple of different ways to change the torques. Oh, it's a nice day. Um, I can change the force. So I can give a small force. I can give a big force. And that causes a bigger torque. The other thing that I can do, not just change the force, but I can change the what? What's the next variable? F? The R, right? That's the next one. And I can apply my force right here, or I can apply my force right here. Which one produces the bigger torque? Applying it out here at the edge of the door? Yeah. In fact, look, if I apply a force right here, it's not going to open the door, right? Because it's not providing any torque. Because when I apply a force right here, what is the value for R? Over here, what is R equal to? R is the distance from the axis of rotation or the hinge to where the force is applied. And if I apply the force at the hinge, what is the value for R? Zero. So zero torque. Look, the door is not moving at all. You can try to open the door like this. In fact, try that today and just see what people around you do. Say, this plastic door is not opening. I don't understand. Oh, my R is too small. It's zero. And so I'm not getting any torque. Uh, so I can change R. The other thing I can do is change the angle theta. If I apply a force at a really small angle theta, I don't get much torque. And that's why when you open a door, you always use an angle of 90 degrees because you get better torque when you open the door that way. 
as opposed to opening the door like this, I don't get any torque or very little torque at all. Okay? You can go out that door, by the way. It, it sits you out on that road in between Elkins and Florida. Okay. Um, when rotate or when not rotating, which will be almost all of our situations, all of our situations, this is a static situation. The net torque is equal to zero. That is to say, the sum of all the torques will equal to zero. All right, so let's try this problem. And I'll show you how that works. So, uh, what is the force required at the end of a lever to hold this object in place? This is a lever. It has an axis of rotation right here. It has one force acting on one end. What is that force acting on this end? Is it two? This object has a mass of two kilograms. So what is the force that it exerts at the end of this lever? That would be a class one lever. What is the force? It's not two. No. Is what? It's not two. No, it's not two. Remember we had these different kinds of forces? And one of them was the weight force. Do you remember how to get the weight, how to find the weight? If I give you the mass, how do you find the weight? You can look back if you like. It's kind of important because you have to do it. I give you the mass, what do I have to multiply it by to change that into a weight? By gravity? Which is 10, right. So if, if you had physics before, you might use 9.8. Those are the same numbers. 9.8 rounds off to 10. Um, so the force here, which is equal to m times g, is equal to 2 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared, or 20 newtons. And I want to know what force is required over here in order to balance this. Now this is a pretty easy one. Let me show you what we would do. We would say the sum of the torques is equal to zero because it's not rotating, so I know that that has to be true. There are two torques acting here. One of them is uh, clockwise. This is a clockwise torque, and one of them is counterclockwise. Now, this is not terribly important for us, but clockwise torques are typically negative and counterclockwise torques are positive. It's not really important for us because really all you have to say is that the torque on one side, it has to equal the torque on the other side. So out of this comes that um, the torque counterclockwise minus the torque clockwise has to be equal to zero are 20 newtons times 2 meters minus F times 2 meters has to equal to zero. Our 40 has to equal to 2F or F equals 20 newtons. Okay? If I wanted this thing to not just be stationary, but I wanted it to accelerate, would F have to be equal to 20, greater than 20, or less than 20 newtons? So this is the situation if it's static. If it's static, the sum of the torque has to equal to zero. So if I want this seesaw to not move at all, I want this force to be 20 newtons, which is the same as the force over here. If I want this thing to rotate, if I want it to accelerate in this direction, this F has to be equal to, greater than, or less than 20 newtons. I want it to accelerate in the clockwise direction. What must F be? Equal, greater, or less than 20 newtons.
Okay, many of you have it right. Twelve of you have it right. Uh, we'll stop at 105. 105. Just guess if you're not sure. No, it has to be, sorry, it has to be uh, greater than 20 newtons. Then if I want it to accelerate, it's kind of like how before when we were talking about if I have an object here that has a force of 5 newtons, if I want it to move to the right, then I need a bigger force. Over here, I need a 10 newton force in order to accelerate it to the right. That will produce an acceleration. And in a similar way here, I need a bigger torque over here if I want this thing to accelerate in the clockwise direction. In order to have a bigger torque, I have to have a force that's bigger than 20 newtons. Because I know 20 newtons, it'll just be static, right? Not move at all. But if I want it to accelerate, I need a bigger force. Let me ask you another question. What if my force was applied right here at one meter? I hack it. If it's applied at one meter, what is going to be the force for static? Uh, I'll give you some options. So F on the right, that's this force right here, FR, must equal what for a static situation that not moving? I'll just give you three options. Um, 20 newtons, 40 newtons, or 10 newtons. Good test question. So I no longer have this force. I've moved it to half the original distance. So it's now one meter from the pivot point. This is two meters from the pivot point. I still have this. I want to know what must this force be in order to balance out that force. In order to do that, you say the sum of the torques equals zero. The torques on the left have to equal the torques on the right, and then figure out what is your force. I'll give you a hint. I mean, this is the same as the left. This is bigger, and this is smaller. So if you want to think about it in that terms, should F on the right be the same, bigger, or smaller than F on the left? Then that would also give you the right answer, if you can discern what that is. Only five of you have it right. Think about the door. Think about the door. Which produces more torque? On the edge or in the middle? Huh? The edge is farthest away from the let me give you a little jump start. So, the way you would start this problem is I would say that the torque on the left has to equal the torque on the right. The torque on the left is 20 newtons times 2 meters, and the torque on the right is FR times my new moment, my new value for R, which is 1 meter. And I want to know what FR must be. All right, we'll stop in a few seconds. I'll stop at 220. Okay, B is right. Have you ever been on a seesaw? Right, with a kid, like a little kid? Where do you have to sit on the seesaw? <laughs> There's a whole board. You can scoot, yeah, you can scoot up close to the middle, or you can scoot out towards the end. Um, so if you have a kid that sits on the end, do you sit on the end? No, because the poor kid will go flying up into the air. Uh, so you have to sit in the middle. So if you weigh 40 newtons, you have to sit here. 
And the 20 Newton kit goes out to the edge. I mean, you're not 40 Newton, but it's like five pounds or whatever. But you get the idea, right? That the bigger weight, the bigger force goes at a smaller value for R. And then that gives you a balancing of force. If you don't get it right now, that's okay. We're going to have more practice with this as we look at different classes of levers. Okay. Um, let's try some of these quick test questions. we do the one on the left here. How is torque similar to a force? Doing pretty well. That's good. All right, let's stop at uh, 55. Five more seconds. Very good. B is right. Uh, the torque changes the rotational motion, the force changes the translational, or the linear motion in a line. Uh, the torque and the force are not exactly the same. They're similar, but they're not exactly the same. C, the torque acts only when the force is perpendicular <coughs> to the moment arm. That's not true. Right? So I can, it's easier for me to open the door if I'm perpendicular, but I can also open the door like this. It's just harder for me to do that. Uh, and then the torque and force both have units of newtons. That's not true either. Uh, the torque force has units of newtons, and torque, which is equal to F times R, has units of newton meters. If I ever ask you about the units, that's how you do it. You look at the equation, and you say, well, this has units of newtons, this has units of meters, and so it has units of newton meters. B is the right answer. Uh, let's try the one on the right. Torques are relevant in which of these types of motion? All right, let's stop at, uh, oh good, let's stop at 27. I think this is a joke. Yes, it's a joke. Good. All right, so D is right. Uh, torques are relevant in rotational motion. Why can you never starve to the death? Starve to death in the desert because of all the sand which is there. Uh, <laughs> Y'all gonna tell people these jokes when you leave? These are good ones. They're golden. All right. Um, good. So rotational motion is right. Okay. So we're gonna look at levers, and I'll need you to know the different types, the class one, two, and three levers, and be able to identify them, and then also be able to calculate the forces that are required to balance those levers, just like the previous problem that we did, and we'll do that again here. Um, so. These are the class of levers. We identify them by three things. The fulcrum, which is the axis of rotation. That's right here. By the effort, that's the force that you expend. And then the resistance force, which is the force that you're pushing against. So we identify them in those three ways. The classes, this is like a seesaw. That's class one. Uh, this is like a wheelbarrow. Your fulcrum is at the end and your resistance is in the middle and then this is the um, class 3 lever we'll make the center 
existence. Oh, I should have done this before here. Oh, wait, there's a hole. Okay, so this is my resistance force, right? The force that I'm working against. What is this? A class one, two, or three lever? This is a class one lever. And then if I put my fulcrum over here, so my fulcrum is rotating about, about this axis. What is this? A class one, two, or three? This is a class two where my effort is. Uh, no, I'm sorry, this is a class three. I'm sorry, it's class three. Yeah, so this is a class three. And then if I switch these two, it's a class two lever. The class three is the hardest to move at all, of all. That if I have my force acting here, this is the hardest one to move. That's how you can move. They sort of get increasingly more difficult. Okay? So make sure you know these different classes of levers. Be able to identify them. We'll look at them in the body too. So by the time we're done, you'll you'll have them down cold. Uh, levers are a type of simple machine. You study simple machines in like on well, third grade, if you remember that. Um, they allow a person to either increase a force or increase a displacement. All right, I'll sort of just redraw these just to help you remember. This is the same as these figures, but I always find that it helps me to redraw things. Uh, so if I have my effort right here and my resistance right here, what class is that? That's a class one lever. Uh, if I have for the class two and three, they're both right here. Uh, for the class three, my effort is there, and my resistance is here. And for the class two, my effort is here, and my resistance is here. So this is two, and then this is three. OK, so let's look at this. Uh, oh, look, that's my wife. We wrote a paper a few years ago about different types of machines and how they're used in the gym. And so this is an overhead machine press, uh, like where you, you load the plates onto it. And if you do that, let's say that you put a 25 pound weight onto the overhead machine press, uh, this plate loaded press, then are you lifting 25 pounds? No, because it's a simple machine. You're actually lifting less than 25 pounds. So if I redraw this, I'm going to redraw it where there is my axis of rotation right there. My weight that is acting is 25 pounds. And then I'm applying a force up here to try to move this, or at least to try to hold it in place. And so I want to know what is that force. First of all, is this a class 1, a class 2, or is it a class 3 lever? All right, class 1, 2, or 3. Bless you. Don't mind what I'm writing up here next. It's for the next question. Okay, let's stop at 45, 45. All right, good. B is right. That is a class two lever. 
where the effort is farthest from the axis of rotation. When you have this force at a big moment, at a big distance from the axis of rotation, it gives you an increased torque. And when I have an increased torque, it's easier for me to lift our resistance weight right here. Now the next question is, what is F? And I'll give you the, the measurements here. Let's say, these are just sort of estimates, but let's say that this distance right here is R, and this distance is half that, or R divided by 2. So tell me then, in order to lift this 25-pound weight on this overhead machine press, this plate-loaded press, what force is required? Is it 100, 50, 25, or 13 pounds? First thing you want to ask yourself, is it more or less, or equal, right? Does it take the same force, F, to lift that 25 pound as the 25 pounds? If it is the same, then the answer is 25. More or less. If it's more, it's either A or B. If it's less, it's C. In general, y'all, that's really great advice when you're taking standardized tests is that you don't try to just get into the details of the question right away, but did you think about sort of the question, okay, which answers can I get rid of right away? And most or many of you will be taking standardized tests, so it's good advice to get practicing that now. Thirty of you have answered it, but only ten of you have it right. Only ten of you have it right. Come on, now think it. Does it take more or less force to lift that twenty-five pound weight with this lever? This class, uh, what is it we say this is a class two lever, right? Mm -hmm. Don't forget to ask your neighbor. Have you asked your neighbor what this is? Yeah. All right, so let's stop here just a few seconds. Good test question. Like, almost certainly going to have this on the test. Um, right, I'm going to stop. 212. Okay, it looks like we were sort of split between B and D, um, with some of you having C. Look, so I know, let's call, uh, let's call this F, uh, what do I want to call it, FE, we'll call it the effort force, that I know that the torque due to the effort force has to be equal to the torque due to the weight. In order for this to, to be a static situation, for it to, to be balanced, that I know that those two torques have to be equal. And I know that torque is equal to F times R. Now, on the left-hand side, I have a big value for R. And then on the right-hand side, I have a little value for R. So that means on the left-hand side, is the force going to be big or small? It has a big R, so it's going to have a small force. Whereas on the right side, I have a small R, so I have a big force. In order for these two numbers to multiply and give the same torques on either side, one of them has a big R, one of them has a big F, and so this one has a small force, and this one has a small distance. R. So with that in mind, what's the answer? Is it 50 or 13 for F? It's going to be 13. That a class 2 lever will decrease the amount of force that you have to apply in order to lift um, a weight. So um, the answer, just for looking at that, it has to be smaller. So that gets rid of A, B, and C, that the force is smaller. Like I can calculate that. I say, uh, 
F times R is equal to 25 times R divided by 2. The R's cancel here and here, and so F is equal to 25 divided by 2, which is 12.5 or 13 pounds. Okay, so the answer there was D. You will have that on the test. It'll be something very, very similar to that, but you'll be fine. You'll be able to do it. Practice these. If you look back at the old test, there are examples of all of those. I always get that question. And then also in the book, there are some examples that they work through. I think we'll do some more too as well. Uh, let's do some quick tests here. Identify these levers. Actually, let's see. Uh, the block on each is the same mass. We're doing the one on the left here. Which lever requires the most force to hold up the block? Which of these require the most force? These are all class what levers? These are all class one levers, right, like a seesaw. But the fulcrum has been moved. You got to raise your hand or are you doing that? Feel free to ask your neighbor for which one of these does F have to be the biggest? Okay, y'all are sort of split right now between B and C. Nobody has A, I don't think. No, nobody has A. And that's good because I know here these distances are the same. So I know that F has to be equal to this. But down here, F is going to be either bigger or smaller. So in one of these, F is going to be really small. And on the other, F is going to be really big. And I want the one where it's big. Where is F the biggest? I require the most effort to hold up this block. I mean, an example here, uh, this is the same situation. This is A. Uh, B is like this, right? See where my fulcrum is? This is B, and then this is C. Or C. B, C. Which one of those requires the most force? B or C? Okay. Okay, good. I'll stop at 2.13. Awesome. D is right. Uh, C, actually, I actually had, I went too far over here, so like I had to put a force up. So this is C, just hardly any force at all. But over here, Ooh, after strain, it's a big force. In fact, the more I go, the harder it is to hold it. The more I go, the harder it is to hold it. Okay, we'll see that, by the way, with the bicep, that the bicep has a really small distance from the axis of rotation to the, uh, the insertion point for the muscle, and so it requires a really big force to lift a not very big mat weight. Okay, that's why your biceps are so big and strong. Well, some people, your biceps are bigger and stronger than other people, right? <laughs> okay, uh, so V is the right answer. I want you to label these as first, second, or third class levers. I would just write them here and then figure out which answer down here is correct. Okay, awesome. Everybody has it right so far. So if you, well, almost everybody has it right right now. So ask around if you're not sure. Hey, if you don't know all your levers, is there one that you for sure know what the, the class it is? If there is, then that might help you figure out what the answer is.
Like sometimes I mix up two and three, but I always know what one is. So if you know what a class one lever is, look at the options. You might be able to figure out what the answer is. All right, let's stop at 110. 110. Good. A is right. Uh, this is a class one, right? I know that's a class one. It's like a seesaw. A seesaw is a class one. So a C is class one. That means I can get rid of those three. So A, it has to be three, two, and one. And in fact, this is a class three lever. I can tell it's class three because this force has to be bigger than it does for this one. The class three is the most inefficient of levers. It, it needs the biggest force to, uh, to move the effort, the resistance. And this is our class two where I have a smaller force required to move the resistance. So it's three, two, and one. You think I'm going to ask you to identify the classes of levers on the exam? Absolutely will. So make sure you know how to do those. Let's do a few more questions. We can go to the back of the book. There's an old exam. There are lots more quizzes on the um, lots more quizzes on the website. Let's do number fifteen here. So the exam one, number fifteen. Is that you, Who is that? Who is you? That's okay. All right. We didn't talk about this explicitly, but I think you can get it. You can figure it out. What happens to the normal force on an inclined plane when the angle increases? So if you imagine this is my inclined plane, I have an object. Uh, there's a normal force acting on that object. What happens as I increase the angle, <laughs> the angle of the inclined plane, what happens to the normal force? More have it wrong than right right now. So ask around your neighbor. Uh, 13 have it right and 15, or no, 14 have it right and 15 have it wrong. All right, let's stop at um, 205, 205, guess if you're not sure. Many more of you have it right now. Um, or seven of you have it, more of you have it right now. Okay, good. V is right. Look, you can think about the extremes of this. So when theta is zero, that's just a flat surface, right? And in this case, the normal force is equal to the weight. And then as I begin increasing theta, my normal force is there. And remember how we talked about the weight is here? But I can break it into its x and its y components that the normal force is equal just to that component of the weight. So a component, a part of the weight, is less than the total of the weight, right? That if I have two vectors that added together equal another vector, the two vectors individually are smaller than the big vector. Or what if I bring this inclined plane all the way up to 90 degrees? and I have the object sitting there, what is the normal force then? 
Well, here it's equal to the weight. Here it's equal to some portion of the weight. What do you think it is here? What is the normal force here? No, it's different from the person punching the wall. What do you think it'll be? B? Oh, I'm going to increase. Um, I don't have a good block. Oh, I use this. Here we go. Look. So here, it's equal to the weight of the, the block. Here is something less than the weight of the block. But what if I have it here? What is the normal force? Is the ruler pushing on the block at all? No. So there's no normal force there. The normal force will decrease as you increase the angle. Now, if you didn't get that answer right, hopefully after you see 16, which we're going to do now, it'll help you think about 15 in a better way. So number 16, the one you're answering now, as the angle theta increases, what happens to the static frictional force? I know that the normal force decreases. So what happens to the static frictional force? Remember how we calculated frictional forces? F was equal to mu Fn. What happens to the static frictional force? Come on now. I already know from 15 that as I increase the angle, the normal force decreases. So what happens to the static frictional force? How many got it right? Uh, 13. 15. Okay, let's stop at uh, 115. <laughs> Um, the static frictional force, look, if the normal force decreases, that means that the frictional force is also going to decrease. So it does decrease. In fact, we saw that. I gave away the answer just a minute ago because, you know, here's the block. As I raise it up, the frictional force is what holds it in place, right? And as that frictional force gets less and less, then it doesn't hold it in place anymore. As it goes up, the normal force decreases, and so that means that the frictional force will also decrease. What's equal? Yeah, FS is equal to mu times the normal force. Yeah, so F, the little F. Well, they're proportional to one another. So if this goes down, this goes down. Yeah. They're not equal, but they are proportional. Yeah. All right, well, class, this class, not a hard class. Well, you can do well in it. But just like any other class, it, it requires effort. So read through your book. Uh, review your notes, work through the old test, do well on this quiz. I want everybody 100% of this quiz on this quiz. It's going to be one of the easier quizzes. I want everybody to Hold on, y'all. I've got a minute. So. They'll be about 10 minutes. Alright? Thursday, right. At the beginning of class, if you're late, do this time on your quiz. Uh, probably not. Read the book. That's, that's the preparation. Have a great day. Okay, I'll see you next week. Have a good weekend. Look, you're going out of that door, huh? It's all right over there.